All right. So the person we've all been waiting for for this long is Mitch Warner, who is who runs um, Ortho Rehab Design, right, right, in Las Vegas, and he has designed the Helios brace. And I've heard so many good things about the Helios brace. Mitch came up um, on his own volition to talk to our group, and so it's a ways to come from Las Vegas. So I'm so happy everyone is here and able to make it and have a great group meeting, great numbers here for Mitch. So, Mitch, welcome. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Elizabeth and Ryan for inviting me to come here. And you've heard something about me. Let me give you some of my background of how I got into the field. I've got into the field because I was actually born with a birth defect, so since I'm walking, I'm wearing some type of device. So that, uh, that led me to get into learning about other devices and prosthetics and orthotics, and that's what got me to this point. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you a lot of information about how I designed the Helios. The Helios was actually a brace that was designed around the needs of a young woman with CMT. And when I first started doing prosthetics and orthotics, I basically specialized in prosthetics. In other words, for artificial limbs, people who ran, people who were very active. And this young woman came to me and she said to me, and this is probably around 1994, she said, Mitch, you know, I saw these guys running in this race for Paralympians, and wonderful artificial limbs made out of carbon fiber. How come there's nothing like that for us, for CMT or people with neuropathy? And it was, it was uh, you had to think about it, but the question was, why is this technology not being developed for bracing? And with artificial limbs, that technology, you know, I hate to use this as example, but you all know the name Oscar Pistorius, the guy who ran, but now he's famous for other things. <laughs> but but those legs are those legs are pre-made. They come out of a box. So if somebody gets an amputation and they're a size 10 foot, you order a size 10 foot in that carbon fiber device. Now, if a person needs a leg brace and they have neuropathy, there is no there's no device that you could just put under there and make it spring. You have to make the existing device go around that lens. So this is what that young woman was looking for, something that would emulate that response of a runner. So we started doing initial designs. Some of them didn't work out so good, and then we finally got to the early stages of the Helios, and that's how the Helios was developed, basically around uh, CMT needs, but I could fit anybody who needs uh, a brace for neuropathy. So that being said, I'm going to take a seat here. Now, can anybody tell me what they think the definition of a leg brace should be, or what they would want it to be? Comfortable. Comfortable? That wasn't in my definition, but that's, a good, that's, very, that's one of the most important things, actually. If it's not comfortable, you're not going to wear it, right? Mm -hmm. Anything else as far as function? Yes? Breathable. Breathable? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's not as hot, you mean? Exactly. Okay. Anything else? Stable and flexible. Stable and flexible. Stability is, you just hit target. That's one of the biggest things on a brace, to be stable. So these really, are all good things. I really like how anybody, how a quote unquote normal person would walk. To walk like a normal person would walk? Yeah. That's the goal. I mean, like, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's the goal, and that's, that's what I strive for. It's not always 100% possible. A lot of times it is, but it depends on how many deficits each person has. Right. Can we win the 100 yards in the uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I've been asked that many times, but no. What was I, that? I, I didn't hear. If he can run 100 yards in the Olympics, did you say? Okay. Well, win it, win it. I don't know. <laughs> But I get asked that a lot, and those are certainly goals, but my goal for any patient that comes to me, and we're talking about CMT, is to get them better balance and stability and get them more functional. Uh, so that being said, an orthosis is actually an orthopedic appliance or apparatus used to support, align, prevent or correct deformities, or to improve the function of movable parts of the body. So the, these things are important because, you know, sometimes people just look at the function. Does it hold my foot up? Well, you could get a lot of different devices to hold that foot up, but if you don't have stability and it's not preventing further deformity, in other words, you can get worse down the road five, ten years from now, it may not really meet the standard definition of everything a device should be. Now, of course, I see, uh, I didn't say this, but I do see mostly CMT patients at this point. This is my specialty. I see a lot of people from around the country, and I'm seeing more and more international patients. 
uh, if, if you want to ask all these patients what's the most common complaints, it's number one is balance loss. Uh, I get patients that call me up and say, look, you know, I know I want to walk well, but if you could just stop me from hanging on to a wall or grabbing something, I'd be happy with that. And of course, we want to do the full thing. We want to go a lot further. So balance loss is the most common complaint CMT patients have when I evaluate for AFOs. Balance loss can cause pathological gait to become more exaggerated. Uh, with standing, balance loss, CMT patients will need to rely on leaning on objects while standing and touching objects such as walls or while walking. Now, pathologic gait, that's a big term. Path, path, what does it mean? Well, it means deviation. So, pathological gait is when the strength, joint mobility, coordination, and, and for walking represent only a fraction of the, of the normal lower limb potential. Most people in this room, I gather, when we talk about pathologic gait, we're going to be talking about the ankle and foot. Does anybody have their knee affected at all? Nobody? Yeah, I, I see that, but you, you, you do? She does? Yeah. Yeah, and that becomes more, and I'll get into that too when we look at pathologic gait for a knee problem, but with CMT, I mostly see ankle and foot, but I do do my fair share of knees. Uh, she has two artificial knees. She has two artificial knees. So the knees affect her while she yeah, walks. The CMT pulled them out. Right? Yeah. What yeah. about hips? Does that ever come up? Hips do come up. You mean you mean weakness of the hips themselves? Yeah. Hip dysplasia and hip. Well, that's that's an orthopedic problem. Yeah. So uh, it's very hard to correct on a functional device anything for the hip, and that's honestly something we just have to accept to make the best device we can, and hopefully it'll make the hip better. But that's that's more of a, like an orthopedic problem that you see a surgeon for, you know, or maybe you don't want to. <laughs> it's hard to say. But anyway, on the ankle and foot, what we're talking about is is a foot drop. So the pathologic gait on an ankle and foot is inappropriate initial contact. And what does that mean? You're not getting a heel strike, or a low heel strike, or a flat foot contact, uh, or a forefoot contact, which means you're tripping. Your, your foot's grabbing the ground. And a flat foot contact, does anyone know what that means? It's the most common thing you see when a CMT patient walks who's unbraced. And ba yeah, basically that, a shuffle, or it's basically a steppage gait, it's this. That's flat foot. So if you can't get a heel strike, in other words, come out here and start to roll over, you're going to lift up at the hip, and that's going to be the only function. But that's gait compensation. Mitch, do you see people who walk on their toes, mostly? Toe walkers? Mm -hmm. Not too many. That's more of like uh, cerebral palsy. Actually, um, I know quite a few people who have like more walking on their toe symptoms. With CMT? Right, go on? Yes. <laughs> you know what that's from? Well, you know what that's probably from? Yeah. Tight heel cords. Tight heel cords. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't get your heel down. Right. So yeah. uncorrected, that, that's what it's going to cause. There's no other way to go. Right. But there's ways to handle that, you know, with and without a brace as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's a good point. Okay. Most common deformity with CMT is what we call a, a Pays Cabot's foot, uh, which is a high arch. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. It certainly is not what you see on everyone. I've heard somebody tell me they're up to say, well, this is what we mostly see. It's not necessarily true. We do see a lot of collapsed feet. We have a foot internally rotates as well, and that's more of a common of a, like a CMT type two foot. Uh, but this can be a very painful condition for some patients because the balls of the foot get a lot of pressure, and sometimes they get calluses or they get breakdown. I once had an FBI agent who actually had uh, an ulcer almost down to his tendon in this condition and not having anything treated. Uh, but that would certainly be the most common classic deformity we're going to see with CMT. The other joint deviations are a varus, what we see in black and white, and that's when the foot hits the outside first, and we see that quite commonly, and a valgus where you have what we call a mid-tarsal collapse where the joint just collapses and the person's almost walking on the inside of their ankle joint. That presents even more challenges because there's more corrections to do to the foot. A lot of times, the foot, uh, the joint is so badly collapsed, sometimes surgery is an only option. And uh, if, if that's the option, then that needs to be done as well. And there's certain doctors that specialize in that foot and ankle surgeries. Okay, so you were saying about the knee, correct? Yeah, cool. Okay. 
So pathological gait in the knee, this is what we see. We see sometimes inadequate extension. The person can't get their knee into full extension. We see flexion that is limited or absent or excessive. Uh, sometimes with excessive flexion, it's used as a balancing compensation. So sometimes CMT patients will actually flex on purpose. Because what does flexing do? Well, if you look at me, I, I'm getting shorter, right? So it's lowering your center of gravity. So, so this compensation makes the base more stable. It brings you lower to the ground. A uh, perfect example of that, sometimes when I used to do much more artificial limbs, if we had a bilateral amputee, somebody who was like six foot two, he's missing both legs, maybe amputated the hair. Well, we, we may bring him, they don't like this, but from six foot two to maybe six foot. Because when you bring them down lower, you're bringing that knee down lower, and you're bringing the center of gravity closer to the ground, they're more stable. If they don't like it, you could make them taller again, <laughs> quite easily. But uh, that's, that would be the way to go. Hyperextension, uh, most commonly observed with CMT, we're going to get a varum or a valgum. Is anybody here in the, in the medical profession? No? Okay. Let's see, uh, we're going to get to the fun stuff, but I just want to get the basics. A varum or a valgum. A varum is when the knee, almost like a bow-legged knee. The knees go outward, and the person rolls on the outside of their foot. A valgum is when the knees go inward, so when the knees almost kind of knock. And these could be serious uh, conditions because you could uh, correctively brace somebody on both legs and then you have the braces hitting each other because you can't, you can't undo the knees. And we see this with people without CMT where their knees knock when they need surgery. Okay, now what are, what are gait deviations? Uh, anyone know? Anyone think they know, want, want to guess? The deviated movements of other muscles. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> well, basically, uh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> the gait deviations are what people do if the foot drops, and like I showed you when I was lifting up on my hip, when you hit that foot slap, you can't, a person can't dorsiflex the foot. So in other words, a person can't lift their toes up when they walk. And this is the most common thing of a CMT perineal neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Of course, CMT is, uh, is muscular and sensory neuropathy. So they can't lift their toes up, so they're going to do different things, compensations, so the feet don't hit the ground and so they don't trip. What do these take the place in most? Typically, it's what we call a steppage gait, when the person will lift up and down from the hip joint. Uh, that will help clear the ground. Some patients do that, and they introduce a circumduction, which is like a half semicircle where they bring the foot outward to, to make sure that the toes don't hit the ground. And sometimes even people vault where they push off the top of their toes in order to clear the ground as well. Uh, I had a patient, and we'll see a video of him. This gentleman came to me from Spain. He's a Paralympian. And I said to him, Alvaro, you're doing, we got to break this habit of these compensations. And he says, compensations uh, in English? He says, no, no. I, I know what you're saying, Mitch, but I don't call it compensations. So I said, what do you call it? He goes, survival. <laughs> so, good point. Okay, and I got ahead of myself because the primary gate deviations with CMT, again. Uh, well, here's one I didn't mention, lateral trunk bending, and I'll demonstrate. So, you have bilateral hip hiking which is basically this, steppage gait. Then you have lateral trunk bending, which some people do this, and they'll do this. And what does that do? When you drop to the opposite side, you make that side shorter. And then you're giving the side you can't clear the ground with extra clearance because you're lifting here. And then again, we had circumduction. They're, they're robbing the, the person of oxygen. So that's why a lot of people with CMT who are doing these things, they get very tired and very fatigued, and a lot of times they burn out these muscles that weren't really made for this purpose. Why does it burn oxygen? What are you talking about? Is so much more work you mean? Yes, yes. So you're doing, you're doing extra steps the way your body was manufactured. <laughs> it wasn't meant to work that way. So you're doing these, you're using your hip flexor muscles to clear the ground when they were only used just to generate the initial push for knee flexion. So now they're lifting straight up and down vertically in order to clear the ground. And people don't realize that if you weigh, so many ways, let's say an even number, 200 pounds. Divide that in half, 100 upper, 100 lower. Divide it again, each leg, 50 pounds per leg. You're lifting 50 extra pounds each time you take a step. And the average person takes about a million steps a year. 
Hard to believe. Wow. Yeah. Again, effects of drop foot and balance loss. Number one, increases oxygen consumption, overtaxes the existing musculature that is working, early fatigue, high risk for tripping and falling. Anybody here get early fatigue? Get tired? Yeah, yeah but you're not wearing your braces. Okay. Question? Increases oxygen consumption? Yes. How does it do that? You're, when, if, you're, if you're running, do you increase your oxygen consumption? I don't run. <laughs> <laughs> if you're working, well, yeah. The more your body is doing physically, okay? You ever see in a gym or on TV when they wear those masks where they're measuring certain meters when people are on a treadmill? Yeah. They're measuring oxygen consumption. So if you're, if you're compensating, you're... If you're, if you're struggling more and you're, and you're taking more steps, you're, you're consuming more oxygen. Than a person who is, as opposed to... Yeah. As a person with normal gait. And there's actually, there's actually studies on this. They, uh, they did a gait study of my brace, which I'm going to get to. And that was the one thing I would have loved them to do with oxygen consumption, because that really shows it. That's a very costly study to do. But, but it's a very common thing. If you Google that, you will see oxygen consumption on all kinds of gait analysis. You know. The effects of uncorrected foot deviations or deformities. Number one, contractures. Uh, and this is what you were talking about, toe walking. The Achilles tendon becomes shortened from a lack of dorsiflexion, and this can cause toe walking. Uh, but it's, it's funny that you said toe walking, because you know what form it usually takes place? Knee hyperextension. Because the person tries to force the heel on the ground, and it pushes the knee backward, mm -hmm. which, which can be pretty bad, because now you have a knee ligament problem. Mm -hmm. So that goes hand in hand, which is number two, ligamentous laxity. Uh, the ligaments become <coughs> a stretch due to improper joint alignment. This causes further instability at the foot and ankle and creates more balance loss. So sometimes when I'm bracing somebody, I'll look at something like that, like you said, toe walking, and think, well, no matter what I do with the brace, there's an alignment issue, and if it's a contracture, we can't change that. The only thing that can release that se severe of a contracture is maybe a tendon lengthening by a surgeon. So in these kind of extreme cases, uh, we'll make a heel wedge to put under the heel so the foot doesn't, the heel doesn't come far as back and get them off their toes. The most, the biggest heel wedge I've had to do was probably about a little more than an inch. But it, it can be higher than that, you know. And, and it depends on the person. Uh, certainly in that circumstance, uh, surgery is recommended, but the person may not want to do surgery. So you just do what you can do uh, mechanically with devices and try and get them stable. Most common symptoms with CMT when evaluating for bracing, well, of course, number one is foot drop. We, we discussed the pes cavus deformity, a varus deformity, valgus deformities, muscle atrophy, and balance loss. Okay, so now we'll get to the fun stuff where you could actually start thinking about taking braces out and looking at them. So the Helios types uh, and corrective techniques for CMT. Number one, what I look at, I, I can't speak for any other orthotist, I can only speak for myself. Like I said, when I'm looking at a CMT patient, number one thing I am looking at is balance restoration. In my, my opinion, and a lot of doctors have told my patients, you can't get balance back from a brace if you've lost it from CMT. In my opinion, if you can't get balance back from a brace, you're never going to walk normally. The balance comes first. Number two, try plane of correction. And try plane of correction, I, in the last year I've heard some orthotists throw try plane around the word and tell them what it is, but I don't know if I accept that. You just can't say that the foot moves in three different planes. We're going to put you in a brace and we're going to look at these planes and post it or put a little orthotic and then correct them. Uh, you have to be able to physically correct the foot in all three planes with a device. You just can't name the planes of movement, which the, the normal foot has anyway. Uh, corrected alignment, and that, that's what we look at the foot. Somebody said they want to be comfortable, and with corrected alignment, that normally helps that as well. I want to prevent further deformity. If it's possible, that's always a goal. 
Uh, the only time you can do that, if somebody has a fixed, rigid contracture, and you can't manipulate or move the foot. If, if I can't physically manipulate a foot and get into correction when I'm molding the patient's limb, the brace won't do it somehow. You, you have to be able to change it from the get-go. Uh, more functional gait. You want to get a good heel strike first. You want to get a rollover. You want the knees to bend as the person walks. You want to get a swing. What does this lead to? Repetitive cycle. Again, heel strike, bending the knee, swing. And then we want to talk about energy return. The Helios is an energy return device. Uh, what, is, what does energy return mean? Uh, like I said, these days, a lot of people will tell you, they'll show you a device and they'll bend it, and they say, well, that's energy return. That's not. Uh, energy return, a device has to be able to load the energy and disperse the energy. Uh, just like you see those patients, the amputees run with the artificial limbs, they're all, people are running, they're all load energy devices, they're all loading it up. They're releasing it. If you put them in a flexible artificial limb that just bent, they reject it. It wouldn't really load the energy up. And there's studies on this as well. Now this, this I left this in here. I mean, triplanar correction. It's a, it's a concept that, like I said, a lot of people throw out there because uh, it's what every brace should do. But unfortunately, most braces do not. So the foot, if you look at the human foot, so I have my little model here, it, it moves in three planes basically. The most common one, foot drop, well, the toes are coming down here. This is the first plane. And this is what, moving from the ankle joint or the tail cruel joint. And this is dorsiflexion, and this is plantar flexion. So a drop foot is uncontrolled plantar flexion like that, okay? Subtalar joint movements are eversion and inversion, so in other words, the joint will move this way or it will move this way, and a lot of times on a CN, uh, CNT type 1 foot, and I once asked a doctor at a conference all the statistics on CNT type 1 and 2 on the deviations, and they said, no, there are no statistics on it. But I could just tell you from uh, visually observing my patients over the years that for some reason, uh, CNT type 1s, a lot of them, they will hit on the outside, okay, not all of them, and the CNT 2s will collapse to the inside. Again, this isn't documented, it's just something what I visually just see in my practice, more than not. Uh, the third plane of movement is what we call the transverse movement. And it's at the mid-tarsal joint, and the transverse is kind of like when the foot collapses and then it moves on a diagonal. So it also moves a little bit like this and like this. Now, how do you, how do you correct stuff like this, folks? I and mean, there's a lot of deviated movement in there, so how, how should a brace correct it? Uh, some people will tell you that you can take almost any brace, carbon fiber, and I'm not trying to put down off-the-shelf braces, but when we talk about an off-the-shelf brace, and I've seen some of them work nicely, an off-the-shelf brace has a flat foot plate, and you're basically putting an orthotic on top of it, and the orthotic really does not come around the foot, the anatomy, and capture it. So basically it just, it just sits on it like this. Now that may be okay if the person does not need triplanar correction, nothing wrong with that. If the person walks well, nothing wrong with it. I'm talking about where the person does need triplanar correction and they do need that correction. So I'm going to take out a Helios and I'll pass these around in a little bit. But you can see the difference on a total contact device that comes all around the foot. It's coming all around it, it's containing it. And when you do your corrections, it locks the anatomy and you want to prevent these droids from collapsing or rotating. So if it's rotating to the outside, on the outer border of the foot, you want to do that. If it's, if it's collapsing to the inside of the foot, you want to do that as well. But when it's in here, you're blocking out that transverse rotation. When it's sitting on a flat device, you're not going to do it. And I'm not the one who designed this shape. At the bottom, this was the shape. This is called the UCBL, the shape at the University of Berkeley uh, Labs. They did this in California. And this was developed in the 1960s to address the lack of correction at these days. So, and you can look this up as well. Uh, Mitch wanted an event, try plan a correction. I use it, but I didn't invent it. But anyway, this is a standard Helios. Uh, this is just a sample brace that made out of carbon fiber. And a lot of braces are made out of carbon fiber. What's different about these braces is that they're energy loading, so they move in the front, front and back plane. 
and they also have a side to side movement. I, you see when I squeeze this, they, they move from side to side. So if a person steps down, it'll have some compensation for uneven ground, grass, etc. And it's hard for me to do it on the floor so everybody can see, but I'll try and do my best up here. But they spring. So in other words, when you bend them, they spring here. Okay, now this is where most artificial limbs load up and spring from so they can take the load. Some braces out there bend here. And I mean, that's okay if it works for you, but when it bends there, it's letting your knee migrate forward. And then it could almost force you into a hip hiking routine. So I've seen that as well, but uh, that's just the way this one works. All right, I'll let you pass it around. And what I'll do is I have a few different ones I'll pass around so you folks can see. This is our fun Helios. We had a lot of fun making it. That's why it's a fun one. <laughs> I don't have anybody that picked all of these colors yet, although I've tried to force a couple of people. But I do have a young woman uh, from upstate New York. Her whole brace is this diamond pattern. You know. So these are basically, it's not paint. These are templates that we have to add after the fact on the brace before it's made. And so it just gives some, some people, either you like it or you don't like it, but some people, to them, it just makes the brace more fun, you know. But this, again, is just another, it's not from an actual patient, it's just, it's just a model. Now, when I was talking about energy return, like I said, I've seen some people, some orthotists, a patient asks them, well, what's energy return? How does it do that? And they'll take a brace out and say, well, yeah, look, it's bending. It's energy return. Well, that's, that's not energy return, folks. That's energy loss because there's, there's no control. So if something's bending and, and, and you're going this way, you're losing a lot of energy because you now have to bring the body back to the midline, okay? So this is just a typical off-the-shelf plastic brace. Uh, this is a kid's version of what we're starting to do now of a Helios. This, this is, uh, feels a little heavy, but it's just a, a sample. But this is a new material we're using inside here, and this bends actually quite a bit. And this, uh, this material is a new blend of carbon fiber that was actually developed in Europe for auto racing. So as far as I know, I'm the only one using this at this point. This is something I don't make in our labs. We have to order it and have it cut up specially for this purpose. Uh, who, who asked me about doing the Olympic? <laughs> you, right? Okay. I couldn't promise you anything, but I don't... Certainly don't promote this to my first time CMT patients for Helios because this has a lot of spring to it. This is the new running version and we have had several people in this version. And this one, again, this one will really, really bend. There's just a lot of energy return in this kind of brace here. Now, the cup. Using the same, the, the same it's the blue one? Yeah. yeah. Just on the smaller one because it's shorter, so it's a shorter lever arm. You're not going to feel as much spring on the shorter one. The only new part right here is that the new carbon part that the rest is the same. Correct. Correct. Now, <coughs> colors are fun, designs are fun, but the braces have to work, right? Mm -hmm. No sense of looking at a pretty brace or a fun brace if you don't get the results you want. So my bracing, my correction techniques, I'll explain them to you. First of all, that's me taking mold. Uh, you have to get a properly corrected mold. So if the foot has deviation, at the time of the molding, if you don't correct out that deviation, you will introduce it into your final brace. So that deviation has to be molded out when you take the mold. Lab modifications or corrections, that's the next step. When I take a mold, it goes into the lab. We then pour the molds out of plaster of Paris, and then we're going to correct the molds for each person's deficit. Test braces, uh, I have, I saw I think at least three of my patients here, so they all know what test braces are. I make a full set of thermoplastic braces first to actually test the fit. So somebody told me they want to be comfortable, so we're testing the comfort. We're testing the alignment, bless you. We're testing uh, the balance. So when I, when I do a test mold, 
we want to see all these things come to light. In the test molding technique, I always tell if some of my patients are concerned about whether a helios will work for them, I can tell them, look, if you're not happy, you could stop at the test mold if you feel this isn't right for you, and you don't have to go any further. And, but I've never had anybody stop it. Uh, then once we do the test molds, we make new molds from the test braces, then we go to the final uh, carbon fiber production, and then we go to the final fitting of the device. How long of a process is that? Uh, typically it's five days, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the new one, on the running brace, it's the same thing, but uh, most of my patients will get, if I start on a Monday, my patients will get their braces Thursday afternoon. With the new type of brace, they won't get them until Friday because uh, there's more time involved in the fabrication. So Mitch, do you have people stay there during that week or go and then most, come back? And most then... people stay. They stay. Most people and stay. Does it take a couple of days for you to adjust the brace once you get it back? Or? Well, you know, because we're doing test braces first, the, oh, adju okay. the adjustments are really uh, minimal. Uh -huh. Sometimes they're not, though. It just depends on the level of deformity and, and complication. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've had people sent to me from LA, and the doctor told them, I don't think anybody can brace shoes, but you have the worst feet I've ever seen. You need surgery. You know? So if we hear that, we know we're up for a challenge. Right. So that person may need more time. I mean, it just depends how much breakdown of the foot there is, you know? Uh, some people are pretty straightforward. You have all different levels. You have some moderate, slightly moderate, and you have very severe. Uh, now, here, here was a severe case, and, and this woman's on my website. Without braces on, she has, and she has CMT type 2, she has a valgus of 29 degrees, and once we reduce the valgus and corrected her, you can see how much straighter that foot on the left uh, looks. It went from 29 degrees to 3 degrees. Now, it's not 100% correction, but that's not reality. You can't always 100% correct something that has that much breakdown, but 26 degree correction is pretty substantial on anybody. The characteristics of the Helios, they, they're all custom made. There's no two that are made alike. Uh, each, one is, each one is made for that specific person. Each one is made for that specific deviation of the foot. There's multiple layers of carbon fiber. Years ago, we were like at 28 layers. Now we're at about 37. Uh, the carbon fiber will not twist and bend like plastic. So in other words, like you take a plastic brace and so if you're standing on this and you want balance and your foot deviates, you're just going to lose it on this. With the carbon fiber, it maintains its shape. That won't happen and the carbon fiber could be made to bend exactly where you want it to bend. Uh, and that's where you can get your energy return when it, when it bends. It starts deflecting stores of energy and then when your foot comes off the ground, it releases it. Uh, and it's an effective spring. Now, this, I love this slide because not everybody, I mean, maybe people, probably a lot more people know now what carbon fiber is, but when I first did it years ago, really nobody knew. Uh, but now there's so many products that use carbon fiber, racing bikes. I have patients that come in and they have racing bikes. They know all about carbon fiber. They're telling me, oh, they, they found it on their bike and, and racing rims made out of carbon fiber. Airplane parts, Boeing has a, a commercial jet, 100% carbon fiber. Sports equipment, satellites, the list keeps going on and on. We're going to see more things being made out of carbon fiber because it's strong and it's lightweight. Now here's again my big thing about balancing and, my, and three rules of balance with any brace. Standing balance is number one. If you cannot stand with balance, you cannot walk with balance. Number two, everyone needs a stable foundation. So balance requires a stable foundation. If the foot and ankle are not corrected in the brace's foot plate, balance will be poor or, or at least compromised. The foot has to be corrected as much as possible for balance to be controlled. Number three, practice. Uh, balance restoration requires practice much like a new sport. The thing about the braces are they don't have any muscles. Persons, they don't have a motor. The person is driving them, they're the motor. So you have to have you have to have time to let your muscles get adapted to the brace. They're going to be working differently. A lot of people, uh, when they first start using the Helios, they're like, wow, is this what normal walking feels like? But their body's not used to it. So it and, they, and sometimes people want to go back to what they knew. They want to do gait compensations of how they walked before. 
So the average person usually needs about one week just to break them in, and really before they overcome any muscle changes and total assimilation, it takes the average person, I would say, uh, one to two months. That doesn't mean they're not going to be walking in the one to two months. They will be, but just to kind of like get through all that, almost like going to a gym and doing new exercises you haven't done before. Now here's my patient from Spain, <laughs> who's the Paralympic, and he actually came to me uh, from Spain with a set of custom-made carbon fiber leg braces. So the reason I took this picture of him, I actually went out into my lab and left him in the patient room. I had to get uh, a few accessories for his brace, and I come back, and he's standing on one leg. I'm like, Al, what are you doing? He says, oh, it, it's amazing. This is the first time in my life I was able to stand on one leg with a brace. I, I've never done this before. And you can see he's listing all the way, almost going to fall to one side, okay? And I'm pretty sure I have a video of him as well. And he said he felt completely stable on one leg? Uh, yep. Let's see, we lost something here. Yo, on, let me, let me get your expertise on the front. I need to click it in the middle to get the video running. Maybe you can figure that out. You just need like a middle click in there on the mouse. Yeah, yeah, on that black screen. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, when we're done, I'll put it on my computer, and if anybody wants to see it, I'll click on it with my mouse and we'll probably get rolling. <coughs> yes? Sure. The braces you make are just are very stiff and, and in good for, for balance and such. Is it true that you're, um, you still have certain muscles working um, that by not using them, you're uh, causing the, the more breakdown? Mm -hmm. Most common question you hear. Okay. And you'll hear from doc and you'll hear from right. doctors too, but. It only applies, let's say I made a rigid brace that had no moving parts, then yeah, it's possible. But when you start to, number one, get a heel strike and roll forward, and you spring and walk more vig vigorously, you can't say it's going to stop it, because I get people who have never been braced, people in their 30s, 20s, who have stick legs, 100% atrophy, never had a brace. So you would think, well, if a brace causes that, why is an unbraced person that atrophy? That's the progression of CNT and just other, other neurological diseases that happens. But if a brace is made where it's, it's overbraced or it's not supporting properly or it's making you work harder with that brace, immobilizing you, yeah, then you can contribute to it. But if the brace is getting you more mobile and more active and more balanced where you're not having to do extra steps and over fatigue your musculature, it can certainly arrest it. And we've had, on a small scale, I'm not going to exaggerate, but on a very small scale, we've had patients where their calves have gotten bigger. It's not what we normally see, but we have seen it. And the patients have reported to their doctors, and the doctors were shocked because they said they'd never seen that happen. It's certainly not the norm, and I don't tell anybody, you get my brace, your, your muscles are going to get bigger. It's not. I don't tell that to anybody. Patients tell me if that happens. But uh, certainly... We haven't seen, I haven't seen that from doing the healers that you're going to make a leg smaller, but it can happen, yeah. That's a good point. It can happen. I have a question. Sure. So my father is, foot is so deformed that he has a mold made for his foot, and right. therefore the shoe is made into a mold, and then he also has kind of a leg with that. The shoe is custom made too? Yeah, so is this workable with that kind of situation? What I've seen, it's very standard base, and his foot wouldn't fit in that. I'd have to see his feet. Yeah. 
Uh, but it just depends. I mean, and that's 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 a tough thing to answer without saying, because we do get. I have some patients who have had that type of thing uh, where they had custom made shoes for many many years, and we got them in the Helios, and then they didn't need it. You know, they just got we got them to regular standard like New Balance type of shoes. But they're certainly out there. I mean, some people do have gross deformity of the joints where only a custom made shoe will work. And that, yeah, that could be an interference, a consideration. It's something that would have to be evaluated case by case. And that's the thing we do too. I mean, uh, a lot of people, not everybody, I mean, certainly my patients know how I work, but I see so many people from out of state and from out of the country that I tell everybody to just send me a videotape first of them walking close up to the feet. We give them directions on what we should look for. I could basically tell after I look at a video whether or not I could help somebody. And usually if I think I could help somebody, I can. Uh, I'm much more selective than I used to be, not that I wasn't. But I, I have had some patients in the past where like no quads and whatever, and I, I didn't want to recommend the Helios thing because I knew it wasn't going to work. You know? uh, and I've had patients say, well, if I want to get it and I want to take that chance, and I say, but at the same time, I know it's not going to work for you. So it's not in your best interest. But usually if I see a video, like if I saw your father's feet and the shoes, I'd have a better answer, you know? I think yes. what we saw in all those braces is a very narrow foot bed, just by perhaps coincidence. And like in my CMT, my foot is spread wide and kind of cramped up high in the We have wide ones. Thing. So <laughs> it's all custom foot to the it's bed of the foot is yeah. part of the, the answer. It doesn't have to be within that very narrow uh, footbed that we were seeing no, and in all honesty, that's a good question. I mean, when I'm when I'm making a sample brace, I'm trying to almost have like a, a uniform shape to it. So, uh, no matter what the shape is, it would be your shaped foot, narrow or big. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. How much deviation does it allow for in weight, either loss or gain, once you actually mold it and make it? Like, uh, my brace is no different than any other brace in that fashion. I would say if, if you're going to lose or gain about 25, 30 pounds, there may be some uh, fitting inconsistencies. Uh, it's going to be most, most of the people we're talking about your calf. The foot doesn't have, the foot and ankle doesn't have much tissue on it, unless sometimes the ankles do. I mean, it depends, but uh, people have edema. Uh, but we see this too with diabetic patients, I mean, where it fluctuates and goes up and down. I, that could be a problem, but if somebody told me I'm going to be losing 30 or 50 pounds, could I get, you know, next year, should I get fitted this week, I would say no. You know, just, just wait, you know. Now, there was, uh, there was a Gates study on the Helios done at uh, UNLV, and uh, it, was, it was done for a functional dynamic response for CMT patients. We had this study started a few years back, and, and the study did prove that the braces are, are an effective tool uh, to deliver energy storing uh, on, on the item and on the patients. Uh, the UNLV study said that the carbon fiber composite construction provides a resistive force versus deflection relationship that makes possible energy storage and exchange relationships that result in improved gauge. The resistive force deflection relationship can be used to measure energy storage in the brace. So they're actually able to me me uh, measure the energy storage in return. These relationships are not matched easily by other routinely used AFO materials such as coal, polymer, plastics. So in other words, this, this would be a plastic. Okay, so like I said, if somebody shows you, uh, you know, a brace and say it's energy storing, it's not. I mean, you can do that with a rubber band too. Rubber band flexes and pulls on it, and so does any kind of flexible device. It has to be able to physically load up and, and, and deflect. And, and these things are, can be scientifically measured. In, in the study, uh, there's, a mag there's a journal out there in prosthetics and orthotics called the Lower Extremity Review. And they actually reviewed the, uh, the UNLV GATE study that was uh, published in GATE and Posture. And the Lower Extremity Review published their review and they said this, they said the AFOs used in the present study were easily accommodated by the participants' own footwear. In addition, the custom design facilitated an intimate fit of the entire brace to the contours of the foot, ankle, and leg, which made it virtually unnoticeable when wearing pants or slacks. This aspect, as well as the noticeably improved function during walking, suggests that the brace used in the current study 
would likely lead to greater compliance. The first outcome of this study, suggesting that participants walk faster, braced, and unbraced, is in contrast to the work published by Graham Harry. We suggest this difference is a result of the custom AFO used in the study, which includes several gait characteristics as well as mechanical characteristics. The benefits of carbon fiber bracing, I touched on these. It maintains its shape. It doesn't torque while uh, you have motion. This is a torque. Uh, anybody have the Helios out there, a sample? <laughs> sample brace that were passed around? They all managed to get. Somebody laughed. Oh, thanks. All right, that's cool. I see out here a lot of people drive Teslas. I mean, imagine if you could do like uh, an electric charge brace. <laughs> it's moving from, uh, you just plug it in at night, and probably down the road, that would be possible. Is Helios your, is that you? Yeah, that's my, that's my device. That's the one I invented. Yeah. Actually, it was actually invented, I did it in 1997. Hmm. In the races. Is that a patented device? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And actually, the, the one that is you can run on is patented as well. You know? uh, but basically, when I say torque, this, this, is, this is a torque of bending motion. So in other words, you come down on it and you get this. And if you have instability, that just adds to your instability. Uh, again, with the Helios, you can't, I don't know if anybody tried to do this, but it, it won't happen. Uh, it'll, it'll happen here is that's where you want it to bend. You want it to bend forward. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if your body's moving forward, you don't want this, and you don't want this. So that's what the brace prevents. You just want to go in a forward motion. You don't, you don't want to get deviated to the side. So and that's, the, that's the greatest thing about carbon. I mean, let's face it, metal can do that too. Metal's heavier, and metal, you can't custom contour. Uh, it would have to be like a suit of armor. I mean, you can't contour it around the limb. Uh, so metal is mostly done with struts, but metal is strong in the same way. And again, I think this is a video. We're not going to be able to get run, but I'll I'll put it on my laptop after. Uh, these are some achievements that we made with CMT braces recently. Uh, this is Guy Williams, patient of ours. He did an interesting Helios. It's hard. I don't know if you can see in here, but each strut is a different color. One that goes around his leg, the inner strut is green and the outer one is blue. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman, one of his biggest goals, of course, was balance and he wanted to be able to play golf again full time. So this, this was his goal and we're glad to say he met it. Yes? Any consideration in design for stairs? That's a very good question and we, we get a lot of patients with muscular dystrophy that call specifically just for stairs. Uh, if, if stairs are the biggest issue, okay, or big hills. If somebody lives in an area where you're going up and down hills all the time, like maybe downtown San Francisco. <laughs> and I have a couple of my patients in downtown San Francisco who we recommended an ankle joint. I don't have a jointed helios here, but basically the joints would go right in here. So it looked like the same thing, and the, and the joints are adjustable, so you could adjust the range of motion. When you're going up steep inclines, non-stop, if that's your daily routine, you, will, you won't get the same amount of energy return because you break up that chain. You're not letting it load because the brace is bending forward. But you have to be realistic. What's the most important consideration? Less energy return or getting over that hill or step. So sometimes you just have to compromise in a situation, discuss the pros and cons of every part of the function, and make a, make a decision. You know? But it's certainly if somebody came to me and they said, look, I live downtown San Francisco, I go up and down hills every day, I, I, I've got to go climb upstairs to my uh, apartment, it's a consideration. You know, and it's something we've done. Uh, other achievements is our marathon man, Steve Witt. Uh, Steve Witt 
completed the Boston Marathon some years back, and he's done half marathons and other marathons. I'm not going to say he's running at full speed. That's not what he does in power walks. Uh, Steve Witt was also a patient model. I'm not going to say the name, but he was a patient model for one of the biggest off-the-shelf brace companies out there. He, and he got all his braces for free, as many as he wanted, but he just he couldn't do these marathons, and it was holding him back. So we discussed it, and it, the company he, he worked with was very professional. I said, yeah, we, we understand the healers is custom made. And, and uh, he continues to do amazing things. Uh, he just actually got one of our new running versions, and he, I'm proud to say he's doing very well. But anyway, that completes my talk. I thank you very much. And having a question. If, if anybody has, I mean, I told Elizabeth this, I'll, I'll, I'll stay as long as you need me to stay. I'll answer any questions you like. If somebody wants me to watch them walk, wants me to give an opinion, whatever you need, I'm here today. So let's just some, with some questions. Uh, I'm sure you have questions for Mitch. Um, that I wanted. Um, so I went and saw Mitch, I think, back in 2005 was when I started. I'm on my second pair now. Um, I've had zero issues with the second pair. Um, in, you know, it's the best purchase I've ever had. Um, I go on walks with my dog every morning, take him on a walk for about 45 minutes, and I have no problems doing that whatsoever. Um, it's, it's a life changer. I would, I literally would probably trade my car for a pair of braces. <laughs> what, what was your experience with insurance? Is it? And energy? Like the energy we Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. <clears throat> I'm sorry, no, we have two questions, so maybe we should just... Go ahead. What was your question? Is the energy loading you're getting with, with Mitch's braces significantly better than when you were wearing I've also told, I mean, there's, there's, if there's any orthotists out there that want to work with me, uh, I'd be glad to speak to anybody and, and, you know, try and do a collaboration. It's up to the person, you know. But we don't we don't mass produce anything. It's all custom, and that's why the price is higher, and that's why it takes longer to do. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So. Karen, you have a question. I, I just wanted to say something. I was in the hospital a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> One of the doctors came in, and he said, <clears throat> "Your condition isn't related to CMT. What's CMT?" <laughs> that's exactly the word he used. What's CMT? I said, well, then how can you say that? How do you know if you don't know what CMT is? Right. Before I forget, does, did, I know people came in after. Does anybody need a copy of this that I was handing out? Who didn't get one? Let's, let's pass it around. Yeah. Can just, what is it? Yeah, you can pass it around. Let me just keep one. This is good. Yes. Sorry. No, go ahead. Are the running brace strictly for running? And would those be like an extra pair you would have another shower? It, it depends on your needs. Uh, for some people, they are. For some people, use them every day. It depends on how bad your balance is. If, you, if somebody's balance is severely affected, I wouldn't even recommend the running brace because it may have too much flexibility for the person. Uh, but I do have some people who have gotten it and they use it for everything. You know, so it just really depends on your evaluation and, you know, it comes down to you know, what you can physically handle and what I think you can handle. How would you know, you, are, you, are you able to know after the, like your, your middle way phase when you do them all, you can try both? Uh, you know oh, I mean? right. Well, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much I can tell, you know. I mean, if it just depends on... you can only pay for one or something. Right, right. Well, the thing is, when I, when I see patients, I test, I do muscle testing. And a big determinant is quadriceps strength. So in other words, if, if, if a person's sitting down and they extend their leg fully out, let's say they can't, they're a little flexed, or if I push down on their foot and they can't maintain that extension, that means their quads are weak. So something that flexes that far forward and is so <laughs> aggressive and agenda as you return may not be a good idea. Yeah, if, you're weak. If, if your quads are too weak, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have some patients whose quads are so weak they can't you know, wear a brace like this. Actually, I have... Uh, Patients, does anybody know what a KFO is? You do? KFO? You have the K in front of the AFO? Well, it means it's a knee ankle foot orthosis, and the brace comes up to here. So it would be like a carbon fiber thigh shell attached to this with metal joints, and that's for somebody whose leg, they have weak quadriceps or the legs hyperextend beyond the normal degree. You just can't control a knee from a below the, no, a below the knee brace 100%. 
So does everybody have a copy of this? I'll explain what this is. This was actually done, it was a gait study done by a physical therapy center in, in Colorado. Unbeknownst to me, I had no clue they were doing this. I had, had a woman who had, she had a toe-off brace and a blue rocker previously coming to me. She got my brace, and I think a month or so later, they did a comparative analysis on their own, without, like again, without my knowledge. So, if you look on the, uh, where it says 10-4-2012, when she had one toe-off brace on, she had increased veering, mild fatigue, and back pain. And again, some patients come to me and they want to get a Helios and say, well, get rid of my back pain. And it, the answer is, I don't know. I mean, if your back pain is due to bad walking and instability, possibly. So she had mild fatigue and back pain with the uh, blue rocker braces. She still had moderate fatigue, increased back pain. So from 10-4-2012 to 1-8-2013, when she got the Helios braces, uh, she had normal mechanics, no fatigue, and that's what I was meaning about oxygen consumption, because that's what they, they test, no pain. Uh, again, with the Helios braces and the other trial, she had no fatigue, normal mechanics, no pain. Fast velocity, so her velocity increased as well. Uh, the comments of the physical therapist uh, said prior to Helios, patient wasn't able to attempt the trial of fast velocity walking due to risk for tripping and falling due to her foot drop and compensatory strategies, which for fatiguing and causing back pain. So basically, a physical therapist is using a lot of the terms I use in this talk today about fatigue and compensation. Uh, she was falling at least one week prior to receiving her Helios braces and sometimes up to three times a week. She fell and broke her foot at the end of May, which required surgery. Since receiving her Helios braces, she has not had one fall. A steady state balance is now WNL, which I don't know what that means. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not a physical, I'm not a physical, who's a physical therapist in here? She previously had moderate sway in Romberg. So that was a pretty good result. And it's, like I said, this was done without my knowledge. So. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes. The first one I had is on driving. On driving. How do people do that? The other is how often are people getting two braces compared to one? Okay. Uh, driving, that's something I was just asked. I fit a woman this past week. She, she drove in a car rental immediately. <laughs> Uh, driving, most people do not have a problem. I've only honestly can remember one person ever having a problem, and it was temporarily, uh, it was an old gentleman, and he was just very afraid of crashing his car. And, uh, but we, we, we got him through, and he did fine. But usually driving, I once broke my foot. You ever see those cast boots they put on people? They, they, they're big, right? They're wide, like Frankenstein boots, and they mobilize the foot. I once broke my foot several years ago, and I had to drive to California from Las Vegas, four and a half hour drive. You can't bend your foot, it's worse constriction than a Helios. I had no problem. Wore that boot for eight weeks driving it. When I took the boot off, I couldn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> My foot felt too small. But no, it's not a problem, but I'm not gonna lie to you and say, oh, it's like that. Somebody may have an issue with it. It's just practice like anything else, you know, but it, I've never seen it stop somebody from driving. You have amputees, missing legs on, on both sides, driving, doing a stick shift with artificial limbs as well. Now, as far as one to two braces, needing one to two, I, I, I just did a guy two months ago from Chicago who did one leg brace. As a matter of fact, I molded him for two just in case. He thought he needed it, but it was real in the middle. And, I, and I, we, we discussed it together. We said, look, you know, if you don't feel or we don't feel as a team that you need both, let's just do one. And you could always do the second one. But if somebody comes in to me and, I, and they say, well, Mitch, I only need one leg brace, and I see them tripping on both, I'm going to let them know. I really recommend two. But if you want one, you get one. As long as your doctor agrees with it. We work by prescription. So if a doctor signs off and he says one or two, in that case, and it does happen, we'll get two prescriptions. It'll say, like, just one left brace or a bilateral. I just wonder again if you could repeat what the price was uh, for leg and uh, for a brace, um, and then also do you do an installment plan? <laughs> we we have Care Credit, which does the installments. It's it's like dentists use it as well, and odontists for like root canal stuff. A, a lot of doctors use it, and they, they let you finance it. It's like a, a credit card for healthcare. Okay. So that's something if you wanted to do, we could you know have you talk to them and.
They have different plans that are available. Care, care, care credit? credit, yeah. It's on our website mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Corey, did you have a question? Um, I was just going to ask if people can run with a normal Helios brace. Is, is that possible? It's possible. It wasn't, it wasn't really designed for 100% running, although we, it is possible. And the reason is that the main Helios is, is really designed for balance control and high activity, power walking. I mean, you mean, you mean jogging as an activity? I wouldn't, at this point, I wouldn't recommend it with the one that I did for running because that, they're the same price. So if somebody can tell me I just want a brace just for running, I'd have to say you would go with a running brace, you're gonna get much better function out of it. You know, but if you buy the running brace, it's probably not going to serve as a good sort of day-to-day -day brace. It depends on your balance and the person's balance. And if the balance is so compromised, you 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 would need a standard Helios. So I just I just had that situation with a gentleman uh, from LA, and he wanted to start with the running brace, and I and I talked him out of it because I felt uh, his balance was so compromised. I felt just doing the regular Helios would be enough for him, and it turned out to be correct. I mean, yeah. the, the thing is, you know, my job is to work with, with my patients as a team and get the best solution. I certainly don't want to steer somebody in the wrong direction where it's not going to work for them, you know. But knowing me, I'd probably redo the grace for free. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Did anybody, if somebody after the fact wanted me to watch them walk or had questions about muscular strength, I'd be glad to. It doesn't have to be about the Helios. It could be about any brace you may, you may want to get. I, you know, I just don't do the Helios. I should have said that. I, I do any brace. I do metal braces. We didn't know that. Oh, no. I mean, look, I have patients uh, on welfare, Medicaid. Medicaid is not going to pay for Helios. As a matter of fact, Medicaid may not pay for the brace you have. Medicaid's job is to give you the least expensive brace. And they're going towards off the shelf. Because now what's happening is people are putting a lot of off the shelf braces out there. Guess what, folks? You can go on the net and you can buy a pair of these for 29 bucks if you want them. <laughs> so now, Medicaid, with what's going on, is they're pushing patients to saying get off the shelf or get the least expensive brace. And, that, and that's where it's going. So Medicaid patients can't even get what like somebody with maybe United Healthcare would get. They're not going to pay for it. It's two, two different systems. Yes. No, they would. They wouldn't. They would. They wouldn't help you because they're not made for you. Could you imagine trying on a dress two sizes too small? No, I'm saying, could you imagine if you did? Right, it won't fit. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. They're, they're, you know, the thing is, I mean, if you certainly want to see how it feels to have it around your leg, I don't mind, but just don't walk on it. Okay. Because you got to remember, each one is made so differently. So the corrections, that these are taken from actual patient molds. So this patient may have corrections that are counterproductive to what you need. That'll make your foot worse to step on it. Because, you know, with CMT, if you have a varus, in other words, it's a foot that's rotating outward to the outside or to the inside, if you're trying on something that's made for the opposite, it's going to put your foot in the wrong direction. So, but you can, you're welcome to lay it on your leg. And, sure. So I'd like to give Mitch a huge round of applause.